Good morning and welcome. Today we welcome Irene Greenwood as our guest preacher as Karen is away on study leave. <clears throat> Irene is a retired church minister serving in both rural and city ministry for 38 years in the three prairie provinces. Now retired, Irene lives in Winnipeg with her partner Joan and enjoys spending time with their five grandchildren. On a volunteer basis, Irene continues her work for the church as a support person for ministry personnel 
and through social justice work. In addition, she occasionally offers leadership for study group in her own congregation. Since retiring, Irene has renewed her interest in music by learning a new instrument, the ukulele. She and Joan participate in jam sessions, playing along with other ukulele players. <clears throat> so welcome. There are just a few announcements to touch on this morning. There will be no Bible study this coming Tuesday. Next Sunday, December 3rd, we will be partaking in communion. And also next Sunday, we are asking that adults and children stay about a half hour after service to help set up the wooden nativity scene outside. Come dressed for the weather, and our many hands will make light work. If anyone is available on Thursday and Friday of this week, during the hours of 9.30 to 4.30, there will be decorating of the church for Advent. Any other info that you might require for this, you can speak to Ruth McKenzie. Wreaths are being sold in the Narthex, and the money raised will be going to One Just City. Betty Jubinville has a couple of announcements, and then Katie has one. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who uh, was able to come to the Progre lunch on last Sunday, and uh, everyone who helped make it such a success. The food was excellent, and we had a great time, so thank you. I would like to first mention the cookie walk. We still need a few bakers, so if you're thinking about doing something this week before Thursday, pull out those recipes and we'd be lovely, happy to take the cookies off your hands. You can deliver them here on Thursday anytime during the day into the upstairs kitchen and the choir members can bring them to choir practice. So we'll be able to box up those cookies on Friday morning. So we need them delivered here on Thursday. Um, the boxes are $20 if you'd like to purchase them. There's order forms in the back and um, there's still a few boxes left available. So if you get those orders in. The cookie sign-up sheet also is at the back of the church. The memory tree service is on December 10th. Roberta and Marilyn are at the back um, selling the little cards. The purpose of the memory tree is just to re uh, for us to take a moment for people who've lost family members, whether it's this year, last year, or many years. Um, it's just a good quiet time to um, take a moment and to remember our family members. The Memory tree service is on December 10th at 4.45, and we light the tree outside at 5 o'clock, and it will stay lit until uh, Epiphany. Also, the people who have already ordered through the office can pick up their cards. They're in a basket at the back. And the funds raised from the memory tree go to Jocelyn House. Thank you. Good morning. We've got yet another brand new hymn for us this week. We're learning lots this fall, it's great. I invite you to turn to More Voices, number 114. More Voices, 114. So the way this works is that you actually have just one little short bit to sing. The refrain at the top of the page, the um, the, where the music and the words are. And then we actually have Suzanne Reimer going to be doing the scripture readings in between each time we do the refrain. So the way the refrain works is that it's marked as one person sings, Behold the face of Christ. I will be one, and you can be all, coming in at O Jesus Christ, O living Christ. So that will give you your cue each time we come back to the refrain when to sing. So we'll do this couple times through perhaps. Wes will play it one time through. Um, the choir will sing it and then let's sing it one more time so that when we get to, uh, to it in the service you'll have a good idea of what's happening. So Wes, thank you.
Suzanne will launch into a beautiful reading and then eventually we come back to it again. Behold the face of Christ. So we do this a few times. We've grouped some of the verses, but you'll see. It'll be very clear when you come in. I'll always start us off with, behold the face of Christ. Thank you. Hope you all got that straight. Good morning. I'm um, glad to be here with you this morning. Um, I do enjoy when I get to come here and uh, hear the lovely music and my apologies to Wes as he just started into that beautiful little uh, prelude and I dropped my water bottle and clanged and so <laughs> when I start the sermon you can you know hit the pedals with your feet. <laughs> I do always ask, or not always, but I often ask when I'm uh, doing some guest preaching that I ask you to be patient with me because I preach in so many different places and every church does things differently and I'm getting old and I don't deal well with changes and my memory is gone. So, you know, if I flub it up, just laugh and have a good time. So, we begin with the acknowledgement of the territory. Long before those of us who are settlers and those who are descendants of settlers came to this land to live, there were people here. We acknowledge that many nations of indigenous peoples have lived on this land. We give thanks for this land, the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Inuit peoples in the heart of the Métis Nation. We gather on Treaty One land and commit to the stewardship of this land and to right relationship. Our opening hymn is in Voices United, number 579, The Church is Wherever God's People Are Praising. invite us into the invitation to worship. Hear and speak these words from long ago. True evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked, it feeds the hungry, it comforts the sorrowful, it shelters the destitute, it serves those that harm it, it binds up that which is wounded, it has become all things to all people. And we join in our opening prayer. In the life of Jesus, we see what it means to love. Have 
help us to recognize that May we recognize and welcome him into our lives and into our hearts. As we welcome him into our hearts, we light a candle representing his presence among us. The light of Christ dwells in this place of gathering and dwells in our hearts. And we give thanks. invite young people to come forward at this time if children are present and when you get up here you can show me where I need to sit <laughs> or stand I can sit right here okay thank you that's good hi well, welcome. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. I have something to show you. Can you hear this okay? I have a picture here. You know what, just for a minute, I'm going to get up and walk around. Can you see this picture? What do you see in it? You see a bear? Okay. A deer, okay. Anything else? A rabbit and a squirrel. Were they easy to see? Yeah. Kind of, yeah, sort of. Did you know that some people wouldn't be able to see those? Some people cannot see those colors. Some people cannot, even if they can see those colors, they can't kind of see everything because of all the confusion around it. All those other colors and dots and everything, right? So sometimes it's hard to see. And in our Bible reading today, I don't know what you're doing in your Sunday school program today, but the big people up here are going to hear a story about how hard it is to recognize Jesus sometimes. And Jesus tells this story to to help people understand that it's not always easy to see Jesus because Jesus can be seen in people like you and me. Did you know that you can be like Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, good for you. Did you know that people will look at you someday and say, I can see Jesus in you? Maybe, maybe not. Well, how do you think we could, in what kind of people do you think we can see Jesus? 
shepherds, nice people, okay. Anything else? You can basically see them in Christians. In Christians, yeah. Anything else? Nope. Nope? Oh, you know what? Jesus would say, yes, you can, well, he wouldn't have said, Christians weren't around when Jesus was walking on the earth, but because Christians are people who follow Jesus. But Jesus would say, if you saw someone on the street who didn't have very warm clothes and he was shivering or she was cold and didn't have enough to eat, Jesus would say, that's me. And if you saw someone who was sick, Jesus would say, that's me. And if you saw G someone who was helping someone was sick, who was sick, Jesus would say, that's me. Oh, you're quick learners. Yeah, Jesus is in, or God is in everybody. And so we need to treat everybody as if it were Jesus. So if you saw someone who was hurting, what would you do? You would help them, right? And that's like helping Jesus. Because Jesus hurts when we hurt. God hurts when we hurt. If you saw someone who was really angry, what would you do? You would try to calm them down. That would be because you know in that person is God or is Jesus, right? Or if it's the really angry, you might not want to have anything to do with it. Well, you might be right because there's sometimes is danger and you have to be very careful, right? Because sometimes you can just you try to make them feel better and then you're making them even more mad and then they might want to start saying some stuff. So you might want to just get out of there. You know what? You're absolutely right. And all that goes to prove is that it's really hard to see Jesus, even in those people that might get really, really angry. But you are right. Sometimes the best way to treat those people is to walk away and say, maybe later they'll be calmer. Maybe later I can say, when you were really angry, it scared me, but I still cared about you. But you're absolutely right, because you never want to put yourself in danger, do you? Yes, yeah, especially if it's at school, they might be able to do some things that... Yeah, that, that's always true. But also, if you're mad and you start doing bad things, then that means you'll get the consequences. Well, that could be true too, but always we need to remember that there's love. Even in those hard times, that someone can still love us. And the person that loves us is... Jesus, always. If you're ever in doubt, say Jesus or God, and that's the right answer. Okay, good. Well, can we have a little prayer? We'll say, thank you, God, for being present in everyone, in those people that we love and care about, but also in the people that sometimes they're hurting and sometimes their hurt makes them angry. Even then we can find you, but help us to know how to respond in love, love for the other person and love for ourselves that helps us care for ourselves in difficult situations. Amen. Well, thank you. You guys are good. I like you. Because you know what? I see God. I see Jesus in all of you. I hope you can see God in Jesus in me. And now, I think you're going to your Sunday school or whatever it is that you do in uh, Sunday morning. Thank you. I would invite us now into the time of prayer, the, in the prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin. Oops. Did I miss the anthem or did you have it? We had it, okay. I'm looking at my, my bulletin and it's a little bit mixed up. Okay.
I would invite us into this time of prayer. In these troubled times, when so much love is needed in our world, when we don't always search for the truth, when we make judgments without all the facts, when we fail to see sacredness in the lives of those caught in the midst of war, when we see people crying, begging, hurting, but fail to see holiness in their eyes, when we hear people demonstrating in the streets, but don't listen to what is being said, when we see pain and suffering, but don't see you, Amen. Know that when we confess our sins, when we look deeply into our makeup, who we are, and the things we do, when we lay those all before God, we are forgiven. We are forgiven in God's love. Thanks be to God. And now we have the hymn that we are learning, number 114 in more voices. And um, I would invite Katie and whoever else is coming up to do this. Let's go. <laughs> give you food to eat? When did we see you, Lord? When did we see you thirsty and give you water to drink? When did we see you, Lord? Lord, when did we see a stranger and welcome you in? When did we see you, Lord? When did we see you naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you, Lord? When, Lord, when did we see you ill and come to sit at your bedside? When did we see you, Lord? When did we see you in prison and come to visit you? When did we see you, Lord? When, Lord, when did we see you, the Christ, the Son of Mary, our brother, our God? When did we see you, Lord?
The reading this morning is the parable of the sheep and goats in which Jesus teaches about the importance of followers caring for the people who get left out. This is a judgment day. The reading is from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will be separating people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom. Prepare for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, You that are accursed Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away and into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God.
It is so lovely to have the handbells here and give us that peaceful time of lovely music, so thank you very much. Let us pray. <clears throat> as we reflect on words that we have heard, as images come to mind, as thoughts enter into our lives. Help us to reflect and hear your way. Give us new insights and old comforts. Amen. I have to say that I'm not often comfortable with Matthew's gospel. Of the gospel writers, especially of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he is a little further removed from Jesus than the others are, at least in terms of time. He wrote his gospel some 70 to 90 years after Jesus died. So he was never really a witness to Jesus' life or to his teachings. Matthew was also a little bit more judgment-oriented than the other gospel writers, and, and I think even more judgment-oriented than Jesus was himself. It seems to be very important to Matthew to be clear about who is in and who is out, making a judgment about who is acceptable and who is not acceptable. And that is certainly evident in today's gospel reading about the sheep and the goats. The sheep are judged to be acceptable, and the goats are judged not acceptable. It is interesting to note, however, that this story is not recorded by anyone else. It, it appears nowhere else in scripture, and not even in some of the other writings of the time that did, that did not make it into the scriptures. As far as I can tell, this Gospel of Matthew seems to be the only place that contains anything like the story of the sheep and goats. So for some time now, I have kind of written off this story, not really worth giving much credence to in my mind. But of course, this week, since I have to preach on it, I found I had to look at that story a little bit more closely. And there is something about it that has made me change my mind a bit. While I am still doubtful that this is a story that Jesus actually told, and while I may not always like Matthew's take on things, I have come to the conclusion that in some ways Matthew is brilliant with what he does with this story. And in particular, where he places it in his gospel and in the life of Jesus. This story about sheep and goats is the very last thing we read about Jesus, according to Matthew's understanding, before we head into the passion story, the story of Jesus' suffering and death. The very next line that we read in this gospel after this story is the following. And so when Jesus had concluded his discourse, he told his disciples, you know that in two days Passover comes and the son of Adam or the son of man will be turned over to be crucified. And then Matthew moves us into that whole story. Well, I'm not going to go into the whole story uh, or into the whole of that story now, but I do want to give you just a little refresher. We know the story is about Jesus being made to suffer. His friends will desert him. They will deny him, say they don't know him. 
He will be held captive in Pilate's courtyard. He will be mocked, beaten. He will be stripped of his clothing. He will be thirsty, and no one will give him water, only sour wine or vinegar. And ultimately, he will feel totally abandoned, even by God. And no one will admit to knowing him, which is a bit of an echo to those words, when did we see you hungry and not give you anything to eat, thirsty and not give you drink, or a foreigner, or naked, or weak, or captive? This story about sheep and goats is a setup for what follows. It's a setup for the crucifixion story. And those being set up are us, the readers of this story. According to Matthew, if we are going to understand the crucifixion story, we need first to understand this story of the sheep and the goats. And one of the first things we need to notice about this story is that both those identified as sheep and those identified as goats are surprised by what Jesus says in the story. Jesus has both the sheep and the goats say to, to the ruler, the one he calls the son of Adam, a name that is sometimes used of Jesus. Jesus has the sheep and the goats say, when did we see you? And when didn't we see you? Both groups are shocked when they are either commended or condemned for their behavior. And what surprised them wasn't their behavior, that is their willingness or unwillingness to care about people in need. Rather, they are surprised that they failed to recognize the one who was called the son of Adam. That the one they either care for or didn't care for is Jesus or maybe God. The story is a little bit confusing here because we are never really quite sure whether it is God or Jesus that we are expected to see in the oppressed of the world. Some people would say Jesus and God are one and the same. Others would be less likely to say this. But I think for the purpose of this story, it doesn't matter a whole lot. Nobody, it seems, expected to see either Jesus or God in the face of the disadvantaged, the down and out, the cast-offs in society. And while we have heard this story a thousand times and we are accustomed to hearing this interpretation of seeing Jesus or God in the oppressed of the world, it is quite another thing to live our lives as if this is significant, as if it really matters. But it does matter. If we want to experience the presence of God deeply and truly, we will look into the need of those around us, whether it be those who live on the street, those who depend on the food that we donate to One Just City, West End Drop-In, or West Broadway Community Service, or Oak Table, the refugee trying to learn English, those who suffer from an illness, those who are so lost in lives of corruption and violence, who are in prison, those who grieve over the loss of a loved one, those who live and die with bombs falling on them, or those who are held hostage, or, or those who have been driven from their homes for the last 75 years, those hurting in so many ways, when we look at such people, there we will see the face of Jesus or the face of God. And if we fail to act, then we are no different than those who failed Jesus as he moved toward the cross. 
Many, many years ago, I read about a woman whose name was Lynn Goodman Strauss. She was known as the Egg Lady on the streets of Austin, Texas. And for years, she was out on the streets at 7.30 every morning, handing out hard-boiled eggs, tortillas, and hot coffee to those who were hungry, worn out, and losing hope. She also ran a Catholic worker residence. She would often drive homeless people to AA meetings, let them shower or even live at that house, give them clothing, and offer them prayers. She reached out a hand where many would recoil in fear. She told the story once of how one man she'd been helping stole her car. And she told that story without a hint of anger, without an ounce of regret. I expect most of us are somewhat familiar with the life of Mother Teresa, who worked among the poorest of the poor in India. She talked about this story of the sheep and the goats. She said of it, it is her favorite Bible story. She wrote, I believe in person to person. Every person is Christ for me. And since there is only one Jesus, that person is the one person in the world at that moment. I see Christ in every person I touch. It is as simple as that. Well, most of us are not called to the kind of drastic life of service that we see in Mother Teresa or in the Egg Lady. But we are called to do what we can in our corner of the world, even if it is just a cubicle in a busy office, or in a classroom of a local school, or in the kitchen of our own home, or on the streets of our city. And we are called to do likewise with the big issues of our world as well. To see the holy in those who have been displaced from their homes in Ukraine, in Gaza, those who have been tortured and killed, and those who have been taken hostages on all sides. And we are called to seek out the truth of what is happening in these places and to know that in the victims on all sides of the violence, we will see the Holy One. This particular Sunday in the church year is often referred to as the Reign of Christ Sunday, or sometimes it's called Christ the King Sunday. Not a name I particularly like. But the, the Sunday is a relatively new celebration in the life of the church. It had its beginning in the early part of the 20th century. And it was created to help people in the church understand that the various political powers in the world are not part of God's will for the world. Indeed, they are the antithesis of what God wants for the world. God's will for the world is not that people have power over one another. It's not that people hurt others, but rather that people learn to serve others and care for them, and in so doing, serve the Holy One. So I would like us, or I would invite us, to look carefully around us not just in this building, but in our lives. Take note of the troubles in the lives of the people around us, whether it be here in our city, on our streets, in our country, in our places of power and our places of no power. And look beyond our borders to the places of the world and see in the face of the people the face of Jesus, 
or perhaps more appropriately, the face of the Holy One. How might that make a difference in how we treat the troubled people of our world? How might it make a difference in how we understand the various political issues of our world? And how will it change the way that we respond to those issues? I expect for most of us, this will not be an easy thing to do because it takes an effort. We have to slow down and actually look at who is it that is hurting? Who is it that is troubled? <clears throat> and we have to work at understanding why various political situations and abuses of power become reality in our world. We cannot brush them aside. We have to take time to really see and then take time to think about what may be happening for them and perhaps take time to pray for the person or for the political situation and see if there is some little or some big deed that could be done for the person or that can be done about the political situation. I would suggest that whatever acts of kindness we might be able to muster, whatever acts of hope and justice we may call for, there we will also see something of God, of the holy. The whole message of Matthew's gospel, I think, can be pretty much summed up in the story of the sheep and the goats. God is present in the suffering of people, and God is present in the suffering of Jesus. And when we are able to reach out to those who are hurting, then we are able to reach out to the holy. Then we will know God. Amen. I would invite us to turn into our Voices United, number 183. We meet you, O Christ. Thank you.
our prayers of the people this morning. Um, the phrase you need to listen for is printed in your bulletin, and um, we, we will respond to that with the sung words from Psalm 92, Voices United 810. So I'm going to begin the prayer with the, th those words, and we can sing the response. And then I would invite us to follow along, or to continue in prayer with those words uh, popping up occasionally. Let us pray. We honor the holy among us and offer our prayers for the world. One, we have reached the end of this Christian year. On this day that we sometimes call Reign of Christ, and we look ahead to a new season, a new year that will begin with Advent. Advent, a time of hope and a time of joy, a time of love, and a time of peace. And yet we live in a world that sometimes feels like it is anything but joyful and hopeful and loving and peaceful. And so we pray for this world. For those who we meet on our streets who are hungry, who live in bus shelters, who long for a warm coat, a blanket, for families who struggle to put food on their tables, for people living in a land that has a strange language that they are now forced to learn. May we see you in all of these people. We honor the holy among us and offer our prayers for the world. We look at our own lives and Oftentimes we recognize that we are blessed, but then there are times when we are hurting, when a loved one is seriously ill or dying, when we are afraid of what is happening around us, when we get angry at a loved one, when life does not go as we think it should. In those times, may we know your presence in our own lives. We honor the holy among us and offer our prayers for the world. We look at the world around us, our political situations in this country and in other countries around us puzzle us at times. They are so difficult to figure out and sometimes we wonder if any government really has the people, the well-being of the people in mind. We look at a troubled world, we see fighting continuing in Ukraine, homes being destroyed. We look at Palestine, Israel, 
And we are horrified. And sometimes we don't understand that history that leaves a people without their home, that leaves another people fearful of the feelings of the world against them. We look at hostages and, and children in prisons and we don't understand and we are quick to judge. Help us to look even there in bombed out buildings, in horror, in prison cells and see you and help us to respond in love. For we honor the holy among us and offer our prayers for the world. And in thanks for your love among us, even in the midst of difficulties, we say Amen. And we join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is a time when we offer our offerings, um, offerings that are received, uh, I don't know the many ways in which you do off offer or offerings. I think uh, maybe many people would do it online, uh, others maybe by par, by checks. Um, and also the offerings, not always of monetary value, there's also the offerings of the work we do in our communities, in our lives, in our families, those two are offerings that we present to God in the hopes that they will be used to make our world a better place. Our offering hymn is in More Voices, number 136, verse 5. <laughs> As we go from this time of worship, let us go knowing that we are invited to look at others around us and see the holy, those people gathered here, but those people on our streets, in our communities, and in the world. Know also that people will look at you and see in you that which is holy. You are indeed holy. Go out being blessed by that holiness. Amen. <laughs> 